welcome to another edition of ATL Prime Sports. I'm Todd, that's JJ, Wayne, our producer in Memphis, and our guest is Lou Gamlin. We'll get to him in a few moments. You can get a hold of all of us at ATL Prime Sports at JJ, get you one at Wayne and RWY Jr., myself at Quarter Todd. I uh, got a little, uh, couple of big news and notes. Uh, of course, you guys know about uh, Mike Soroka. He made his uh, rehab debut at Rome today. Three scoreless innings, 31 pitches, 25 strikes. Looks like LSU is going to all lengths to go get a kicker. They got one at a fret party, a former Division One kicker, and they'll have to work on his uh, conditioning, said uh, head coach uh, Lane Kiffin at Ole Miss. Uh, guys, how you doing? JJ, how are you? Man, I'm doing pretty good. I'm not as hot as Vaughn Grissom, though. Six <laughs> games, six runs, and uh, over 400 average. Welcome to the bigs. <laughs> uh, Wayne, how are you? Well, we got a little bit of uh, Formula One meets NASCAR news coming up. They're going to be up in Watkins Glen, Watkins Glen, New York this coming weekend. And former Formula One champion Kimi Raikkonen will be driving one of the race cars. It's a one-race deal, and uh, that should be pretty exciting to watch that. I bet it will be. And Liz, our Lou, our guest, Lou Gamblin, uh, Freeland High School football play-by-play and Michigan Sports Radio, Aquinas Hockey College hockey play by play, host of the Hampton Lou Extravaganza on Belly Up Sports. You can get him at Real Captain Lou on Twitter. Lou, thanks for joining us this evening at the last minute. Hey, no problem, Todd. Thanks for having me on tonight. It's always a pleasure. All right, we're going to do a little round table slash guest here. Let's uh, get right into it. We're going to talk Lions and Falcons, a little Big Ten preview. And we'll talk a little Braves later on the show. Let's start it off with you, Lou, since you are a guest. Uh, Lions-Falcons preseason game. The Lions have been getting a lot of hype on HBO Hard Knocks, and they sure look good on the first drive. The three first-round jab choices on the offensive line were as good as advertised. Jared Goff looked real sharp against Atlanta, who defensively has got a lot of work to do, especially on the line of scrimmage. Well, yeah, you know, they ran into Detroit's. uh, This is one of the better offensive lines I think I've ever seen the Lions have since I've watched them. You know, maybe before Eric Andelsek and Mike Utley had their unfortunate accidents, if you will. But, you know, it's looking promising. The first drive was nice. You know, I think the Lions offense has got a lot of weapons and they're going to need them. Um, Hutchinson looked great on the defensive side, but. Their glaring weakness, again, the middle of that uh, defensive uh, formation, the linebacking play, I think, for Detroit is still very weak. And, you know, the jury's still out on Okuda if he can stay healthy and, you know, maintain. But I got to tell you, I'm drinking the Kool-Aid. You know, I know I do it every year, but, I, you know, the hype that Campbell brings, I think he's assembled a great uh, coaching staff, <clears throat> and Goff does look good. Um, I, as far as Atlanta goes, I was impressed with Ritter. You know, again, they were playing a second and third unit for the Lions when he was in there. But, you know, I was impressed with his rookie start. You know, he had to be nervous. And, you know, guys, um, one thing about the Falcons, and maybe it's because they went and scored, Mariota scored on his first drive. I heard the other day and I read that the over-under for passing yards from Mariota is 2,000. And I put a little coin on that. I took the over. So I, I don't know if that means anything, but I'm ready for the Lions. I'm ready for Indianapolis this weekend for the preseason game. Lou, well, we have a joke here amongst the three of us, and we'll <laughs> tell you what it is right now. The Lions and Falcons, what do I call them, fellas? Cousins. cousins. They're cousins. I mean, other than the Falcons have been to the two Super Bowls, they've had, you know, a better – overall play in the last X amount of years, they're cousins. Franchises in futility. Wayne is a Falcons fan. JJ's a Falcons fan. I'm a Lions fan, and I do wish the Falcons well, except when they play Detroit. And I know, Lou, you're a Lions fan, being yeah. a Michigander all your life, and actually being a Uber. Yeah. So, um, but, uh, y- you know, that's that's the joke here is cousins. And when I watched each club on the 
first drive, JJ, they looked like cousins. Offenses did real good. Defenses, not so much. Well, speaking of defense, Lou, I'm going to ask you about the Lions' first overall draft pick, Aiden Hutchinson. Got started right away, had a tackle for loss, mm -hmm. forced Marcus Mariota out of bounds uh, after a seven-yard gain. Uh, did pretty good job open field tackling there. What do you think of Aiden Hutchinson, the hometown hero, supposedly? Well, I'll tell you, I'm excited for him. He's got the pedigree. You know, he his dad was a former pro ball player, you know, for a lot of years. And he's got the height and he's got the talent. You know, it I he got pushed around a little bit in that playoff game against Georgia, but who didn't? I mean, yeah. you know, that that was just a throttling, a beatdown. I think, you know, he's a good leader. He's going to be a good leader. Um, uh, he's got the talent. I uh, Again, give me a chance to see him against, with all due respect to Atlanta, give me a chance to see him against some good competition once the season starts, you know, once they start playing for keeps week one against uh, Philadelphia. The reason I say that, you know, is I'm, I'm cautiously optimistic. We've been down that road so many times. But we're going to need them as Lion fans. They're going to need them because, like I said, I think our defense is definitely going to be our Achilles heel. Maybe not so much on the defensive line, but the back seven is going to be brutal and until they can figure something out. But I'll tell you, he brings the hype, and I think he brings the talent. Um, it's going to be fun to watch. No doubt it will be. And Did you see Lou on Twitter, the Michigan Attorney General, her son, Brought up a Spartan football asking uh, Hutchinson, <laughs> and he laughed and walked away. <laughs> I saw that today. That that's, <laughs> that's funny. You know, it, it's such a running gag with her right now because, uh, you know, she even said he's kind of a smart ass. So, but, you know, it. She, she should try to shy away from anything Michigan and Michigan State after she fell asleep at the game last year. <laughs> I'm so glad you mentioned that. Wayne, have you ever fallen asleep in a football game? And I know J.J. hasn't. No, I've, I've only fallen yeah. asleep during uh, extended play uh, NASCAR uh, <laughs> races uh, when the drone of the car has really set me to sleep. But I did want to tell you about an incident that happened to me down in uh, Orange Beach, uh, Alabama. I don't know if you're familiar with that. But uh, I had found a, uh, a, uh, a lamp that had washed up on the beach, and it looked really ancient. And so I thought, hey, take a chance. I'll rub it. Sure enough, Jeannie comes out. I said, he said, uh, you get one wish. I said, fantastic. I'll, uh, I want to live forever. <laughs> but Jeannie says, I can't grant you that kind of wish. I'm sorry. You're going to have to think of something else. And I said, okay, let me, uh, how about this? How about uh, I want to live long enough to see the Detroit Lions win the Super Bowl? <laughs> Well, <laughs> within 10 years, baby, I got a feeling. Within well, 10 years. You it might be such a good deal for me then. <laughs> Wait, you may be living forever. Well, that could or be not. too. That was a good one. You know, the Falcons in that conversation. They're, they're hey, positive, you know, I, I, the, the uh, Minnesota Vikings could also fit that bill. Oh, that's one oh, of my. Oh, man. Sticking yeah. it to the rival in the division. Yeah, uh, yeah, that's possible. All right, let's go from the Falcons, Lions. Lou, let's do a little bit of Big Ten preview here. Uh, Ohio State, again, the favorite, even though they were throttled by Michigan's offense and defensive line in the big house last year. The Buckeyes, of course, they're good as advertised offensively. It just depends whether Jim Knowles can get that defense of Ohio State going, coming over for Oklahoma State. Then, of course, on the other side of the ledger, Michigan's got some folks to replace, especially oh on the defensive side of the ball. And the third point is Michigan's schedule is tailor-made. They're not going to get tested till week five in Iowa. Their first four games are in a big house, and they're against uh, Patsies, basically. Colorado State, Hawaii, Connecticut. I mean, mm. it, Michigan should be 4-0 going into Iowa easily. Oh, I agree with that. I think that Michigan – realistically is a 10 win team, nine, 10 win team. I said this last week, I had uh, a couple of fellows on my show from Chicago and they asked me about Jim Harbaugh in Michigan. I said, I love what Harbaugh's done. Um, you know, if you compare him to Dabo Sweeney, it took Sweeney nine years to win a championship or get to that point. 
I think this is year eight or nine for Harbaugh, you know, but I got to tell you, Todd, guys, I am afraid of Ohio State as a Michigan guy because they have that, you know, that proverbial chip on their shoulder. They're circling that game down in Columbus and they're loaded. And they're, to me, I think they're legit top two in the country going down to the horseshoe uh, in, you know, late November. Uh, they're going to have that in the back of their mind. Stroud is amazing. And, you know, it just, you know, they don't, they don't regroup, they reload and whatever they lost, they're going to gain, you know, yeah, they'll miss Alave for about two weeks and then somebody else will show up. Michigan, you know, I, 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 I like what they have on offense. I, you know, obviously the question mark for me is going to be defense because they lost a lot of talent, you know, like you mentioned with, uh, losing um Hutchinson to the pros and you know Ojabo. Ojabo I mean they got some shoes to fill and Michigan State is going to be right there I I love Peyton Thorne I think he's uh, underrated at quarterback uh they got the running back transfer from Wisconsin um and you know obviously their their weakness is going to be defense as well but I think it's going to be a three horse race and it's imbalanced in my opinion. I think Wisconsin's going to skate to the big 10 championship game. And it's like the sec West and the sec East to me, there's, you know, the sec West without Georgia, I, I forgot about Georgia, but I think on the big 10 on the Western side, you know, Wisconsin, I think would be fourth best team in the East. So it's a three horse race on paper, but I think Ohio state's definitely head and shoulders above everybody else. Quickly. What about Penn state Lou? And then JJ take the next one because nobody's really talking about them. They got a talented quarterback in Clifford. It said, depends on the offensive line for me, for Penn state. I just think it comes down, you know, everybody's got Franklin on this pedestal. What does he want? He did win a big 10 championship. He won one. He didn't go to the playoffs yet. No, I get it. You know, they couldn't go for some reason. They took Ohio State. I just, I don't know. I, their offensive line is their weakness. I agree. And I just think that, I don't think they have the weapons of Ohio State. I, I'm telling you, Michigan State's not getting a lot of love. They're going to be right there. We'll see how they are when they play Ohio State. Then they got to go to the big house. But I just think Penn State's still the fourth best team in that division. Yeah, the East is stacked. The West, you mentioned Wisconsin. I think someone could surprise and uh, make a championship run out of that. Might be the Minnesota Golden Gophers, ski you ma, as they say. Uh, who, who, give me, give me a surprise team out there. Well, you know, in in the West, that is. I, I, the only other team I could think of, you know, Todd mentioned Iowa being a test for Michigan in Week Five. I mean, they're always there. Um, you know, uh, maybe Nebraska there, you know, Frost is coaching for his job, although it seems yeah. like he is every year. Um, but it, it's funny because Nebraska is not nearly what they used to be. And, no. you know, it's now it's, I think the West are going to be patsies until UCLA comes along when they or I'm sorry, USC, you know, I'm sure they're going to go on the West in the West, but, um, I don't know. I just Wisconsin to me looks too good, and I, PJ Fleck is another one. You know, he's 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 all he's all hot air. I mean, I like the guy, but you know, he's I, rowing the boat. I think that's starting to get old in the Big Ten, and I you know he's got to take that next step. He's got to win those big games, and I, I until he wins one, I think it's Wisconsin's to lose. Wayne, your surprise is Purdue out west, isn't it? Yes, I think oh. Purdue is going to be the dark horse for the entire conference. That'd be fun. That's a fun place to go. Yeah. Uh, quick story on Purdue. My son and I, this, we were, uh, it was a Saturday morning. This My son was about eight, I think, if I remember right. <laughs> and um, yeah, I had him for the weekend. And I see we, Friday night, we're looking at each other. I said, what do you want to do tomorrow? He says, I don't know, Dad. I said, how would you like to go watch Michigan and Purdue? He's like, <laughs> on TV? I said, no, down at West Lafayette. It's about a three-hour drive from where we live. So I went on uh, StubHub. They had second row from the top tickets going for a dollar. 
Hmm. So we paid a dollar for the tickets each plus the five dollar service fee. We got two tickets in the end zone and we cost us twelve bucks. Wow. Well, <laughs> the end zone's where, the end zone's where the party's at too. Oh, it was fun. Great seats. Michigan won. That was a bonus for us, but it was it was a cool weekend, you know. It, it was a lot of fun. Well, let's go from the end zone to the Izzo zone. Tom Izzo at we'll do a little college basketball is now a Spartan for life. He signed an extension. Terms are undisclosed. And, let, you know, Lou, I, Michigan State has lost a little bit here in basketball. The pandemic didn't hurt and all. Uh, they've got a good recruiting class coming up in oh. 23. Michigan has a good one this year. I think that rivalry is getting ready to heat up, and it could and it could be for the Big Ten for a few years to come. I, I just – Michigan and Michigan State to be there along with the same cast of characters and I expect the rivalry to become really good and become national um you know Todd it's funny as uh my brother-in-law and I were talking about it, and he knows quite a few people at you know in the Michigan State circle uh and he was stunned that he signed that extension because a lot of people around here were thinking you know with with NIL and you know the transfer portal and this and that and, you know, Tom's been a little frustrated there in East Lansing, and we thought he was going to retire. And he signed that extension, and then to see this class that he's got coming in for 2023, holy cow. You know, they went from, what, 35th to 3rd or 2nd uh, right. in the country. Right. You know, it, it's it's cool to see because, he, you know, he he does it the right way, and, yep. you know, he's been here forever. Um you know, I can remember watching him play high school basketball up in the UP um, right you know, 50 years ago, however long ago it was, back in the early 70s, mid, you know, and and it, it, from a nostalgia standpoint, it's great to see him there. I I think they're going to be good in a couple of years. Um, you know, it just, I don't know. You know, it's funny because I was asked this question yesterday, guys, and I'll pose it to you about what uh, uh, Calipari said oh, about Kentucky. We're going to bring that up, but go ahead. You know, and it, it just – you don't hear that out of Izzo. You know, I mean, he's not, you know, posturing to get stuff. I mean, Todd, I, you probably know this. How much money did Izzo put – he donate to the football program for the facility? Millions. You yep. know, and yep. tell me a basketball coach – at any other college that would do that, if they're doing it, you don't hear about it, you know. And you know, so, uh, I uh, uh, Penny, I Penny, Penny Hardaway would do it, but the NCAA oh. might uh, find a way to sanction the school for that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Hey, you know what? If I can answer that first, and then you guys answer it. Um, Kentucky, each coach is right. Stoops is right. He's trying to get. His, his program at Kentucky, they've had a couple 10-win seasons. But Kyle Perry is right. Kentucky is a basketball school. They got together with Mitch Barnhart, the, DA, the, the AD of Kentucky. Now, I'm sure they worked things out. Look, you got anything, do it in private, not in public, because honestly, it hurts the basketball program and the football program. Each coach is right, though, about each his program. But they got to come together. Calipari is ticked off because – they haven't spent any money in the basketball facility since 07 in Kentucky, and that eight it's at ancient. And then you look at the football facilities, they moved, they they moved in a positive direction, spent a ton of money there, and also in other sports. So Calipari wants his own. And then of course Stoops wants his own. And I can't blame each other. So they're each correct. JJ, your thoughts. Yeah, no, uh you you made a good point, but Football is the money maker at every school. It doesn't matter. There's 80,000 fans in each and every, pretty, pretty much each and every SEC venue uh, versus 15 or 20,000 in your basketball arenas. And let's face it, you need football and basketball to coincide at Kentucky. They need to be on the same page. I think Stoops has taken the high road here. I, I don't like what Calipari is saying publicly, as you mentioned, Thank but you. they were both technically right. We, we When you think Kentucky, what do you think? Tubby Smith in the 97 National Championship. You think Calipari's one and done and their amazing run, losing in the National Championship, winning one another. 
it's a basketball school. It just is. Now, you mentioned how they're both right. They have to learn how to coincide with each other now. And if that happens, watch out. Kentucky football's had two 10-win seasons in the last four years, and they finished runner-up to Georgia last year in the SEC East, folks, not Florida. So they are both right, but they got to learn how to coexist. Wayne, you have experience with Calipari there being a Memphis guy. (laughs) Yeah, well, one thing I can tell you is um, just like uh, Kentucky, Memphis is also a basketball school, but uh, Penny Hardaway would have much more class than to say something like that. Uh, especially on public TV. It doesn't do anything but undercut the entire uh, school and the program. So, Calipari is a snake oil salesman. He's one <laughs> step ahead of the law, you know, yeah. be it, you know, academically or whatnot. But here's the thing, too, and you're going to see this in other programs, especially with NIL. You know, we've talked about, I've talked about this with a lot of folks. You got this money now that these donors, you know, what's set aside for programs or whatnot. Now they're going to start paying these kids a million dollars or, you know, a basketball team each 100K. That's, you know, 1.5 to $2 million. Now I know that's a drop in the bucket maybe, but that's one thing you got to consider too. But getting back to Calipari, he's never, you know, you, you can't, I'm sorry. Yeah, he did win at Memphis and he won, you know, at Kentucky and at UMass, but you know, one thing he, he's never had, in my opinion, is class. Yeah. So, well, class. everything everything he did here in Memphis got vacated anyway. So right. Yeah. <laughs> well, there you go. It's very true, and at UMass too, if I'm not mistaken. <laughs> yeah. Ask Marcus Camby. <laughs> you know, it's like Republicans and Democrats. We all need to come together. So huh. I look, come together right, right now. now. Yeah, I'm not. Saying that, that is out. I mean, no way. So anyhow, uh, Lou, uh, thanks for coming on. I'll see you. My pleasure. Uh, Especially, hopefully in March, we'll be in Marble, Mass, doing the ACHA Nationals, and hopefully we'll work together again. Yeah, that'd be good. And uh, Todd, I'll get a hold of you. We'll get you on the show once. uh, I'm probably going to be back to Tuesday nights uh, after Labor Day with my podcast. So um, we'll get you going on. We've got... uh, Football starting out up here next, you know, next couple of weeks on Thursday and coaches shows and whatnot. It's a busy time of year, but man, I love it. Football's back, baby. Yeah, I love yeah Lou. Before we let you go, man, shout out our uh, your podcast for our listeners and how our listeners can get a hold of you on social media. Well, thank you very much, guys. Yeah, it's the Captain Lou Extravaganza. Um, it airs on my YouTube channel, which is the Captain Lou Sports Network. You can always also watch it live on my Twitter page, which is Real Captain Lou, or my Facebook page, uh, The Captain Lou Extravaganza. You can follow that or my name, Louis Gamlin. Uh, it's powered by Belly Up Sports. I've joined their podcast network. Uh, they've got a, you know, a lot of reach, and uh, it's been a lot of fun. Uh, it took about six weeks, eight weeks off just to recharge. It's been a busy summer, but... We're going to be doing that. I've got my Captain Lou six pack challenge coming back uh, around Labor Day, where you got to pick the games that I pick. If you beat me, you're in the drawing for some great prizes. And also, we're going to bring back the ACHA Power Play podcast, which is going to be once or twice a month, where I have it's just exclusive American Collegiate Hockey Association coaches and players. We interview them. And, uh, you know, as Todd knows, it's a great organization. And uh, we're going to start that back up, and you'll be able to see that on my channel as well as the ACHA website as they start the road to Boston in March of 2023. Hopefully we can catch a Bruins game while we're there, but I <laughs> doubt it, but we'll see. You never know. It's all about timing. So, yep. Lou, thanks for coming on. I know you had only about 15 minutes. Yeah, stuff. thanks. Oh, appreciate thanks, it. guys. Appreciate it. Yep. Right. You take care. All right. See ya. See ya. That's Lou Gamlin here on ATL Prime Sports. Again, I'm Todd. He's JJ. That's Wayne, our producer. JJ comes from the other side of the ATL. Wayne is in Memphis. And, guys, now it's the three of us. Um, I tell you what, uh, some you know, I, I like some of what Lou said uh, in terms of basketball and, and football coming together as one instead of coming apart. And I'm, you know what, these coaches, and I'll say this, 
now that Calipari used this um, against the Kentucky football program, we'll go to other subjects. The first thing, Saban, Smart, uh, Fisher, what are they going to do? They're going to go to somebody's house and go, Calipari said Kentucky's a basketball school. Why in the hell do you want to go to school there? JJ? I mean, that's exactly what's going to happen. Uh, you know these coaches do it, uh, and he, he, that's why I said they got to coexist with each other because recruiting in basketball recruits helps recruiting in football. If your basketball school's good and you, uh, your football is better or vice versa, you can get recruits just that way by making sure you're on the same page. It works out both uh, for both programs, football and basketball. Wayne? Yeah, well, I tell you, I think the greatest uh, coach for doing these uh, cross sports things within the university was uh, Bruce Pearl. Uh, you know, he really likes to, when he was at Tennessee, he got involved with doing stuff with all the different sports, showing up to their games, showing up to their pep rally, did the same thing down in Auburn. So if anybody yeah. wants to start doing that, I would say go buy his playbook or maybe if he's got a real book out there, read it. <laughs> Yeah, you're right about that, Wayne. I mean, you've seen Bruce Pearl in the uh, student section of football games with the shirt off, painted orange, and the students like that, and so do recruits. So take a page from that Auburn book, Kentucky. And, and you know what? And, and from, from Michigan, we uh, Tom Izzo, what he's done has been documented. We talked about it on the show. Jim Harbaugh does a good job. At Michigan, he goes to a lot of basketball games. You'll see him in a baseball game. You'll see him in a softball game. And and that's something that the university needs to be promoted. Let's go ahead and move on. Let's talk. We'll stick with football. We'll end the show with baseball. Before you do that, you can like and subscribe. Uh, you can get the show, as you guys all know, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, uh, Apple, YouTube. Spotify. And YouTube, yep. I was getting to YouTube. Thanks for the tip. I appreciate that. I'll just give you some assistance in that area. And uh, <laughs> we'll go ahead and we'll talk some Falcons now. What we learned about the Falcons and their first exhibition game. Uh, JJ, what did you learn watching it? Well, I learned a lot of things. I learned that Marcus Mariota looks to be like your starting quarterback. I see Red Ritter still wanting to get outside of the pocket instead of use the pocket to the very last second, throw your old receiver open. He wants to get out, try and extend the play before it needs to be extended. Uh, I think that's what I noticed most. Mariota's the, the team starting quarterback for now, and unless things go south, it is Marcus Mariota's job to lose. He looked pretty good on the first drive, two for two. On those two throws, he averaged 18 yards. Completion to Drake London, where he hurt his knee. He could be out the whole rest of the preseason. So that could be a question mark to look forward to because another thing I saw is the depleted wide receiver core without Calvin Ridley there and the injury to, just like I mentioned, London, very, very thin. The Falcons can't afford to lose much. So those are the two things that have stood out to me. Marcus Mariota is your starter, and the Falcons are very thin at wide receiver. I'll tell you what I noticed in uh, what I learned in, in, in the game against Detroit was uh, Tyler Algier. He blocked the Lions' middle linebacker, picked up the blitz on the game-winning drive from Ritter, the touchdown pass to win the game. That yep. a year ago was not happening. To me, that was a positive. Another thing I noticed is the Falcons were able to run the football uh, 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 on the first drive against Destroy Detroit, especially, you know, despite Hutchinson making the tackle for the loss in the backfield, I just noticed the offensive line getting a better push. And, it, and the Falcons should be a little bit more physical on all, on, on offense this year. They ran for 168. That includes um, what Ritter ran for 60. Of course, you're going against second and third strings, so it's kind of hard to tell. Uh, in terms of that, but the first drive was the telltale for me. Uh, they won uh, the line of scrimmage on the offensive line. Now, if we flip the script, for me, def defensively, I know Dan Pease made the big passionate plea on his Pease in the Pod podcast, and also he made a, a, a plea to the media that this defense, this is done. We're tired of this is not acceptable anymore. We're going to play well. 
Well, that first drive against Detroit, Detroit knocked them off the ball. There were large holes. They knew they were going to run the football. They stuck guys in the box, and they still couldn't stop them. To me, that is a major, major concern. And, you know, when you get ran for 100-plus, I know three different uh, uh, springs of, uh, of the team played. That, to me, is what I learned. Wayne, what did you learn? Well, I, same thing that y'all just said. Uh, I'm a little bit uh, – I'm waiting to find out what Philippe Franks is going to do. Uh, I'd like to see that. But um, the other thing that I noticed this weekend is uh, there's an opportunity up in Cleveland for Joshua Dobbs to really show everybody something, and uh, I look forward to seeing how that plays out. That's interesting. Since, um, um, you know, uh, we all know the starting quarterback there for Cleveland, uh, he, he didn't throw for very many yards, and uh, he didn't look very well, and the fans let him have it. Yeah. So, J.J., expand on Wayne's comment there. Boy, Cleveland fans are biting their fingernails right now. They don't know what's going on. Deshaun Watson might be gone for the year. You mentioned Jacoby Brissett, uh, and now you're right. Josh Dobbs, uh, former Tennessee, back up to Ben Roethlisberger in Pittsburgh for a while. This could be an opportunity to come in and make something out of absolutely nothing. Um a couple players switching sports, but same opportunity. Grissom here in Atlanta. Michael Harris here in Atlanta. Injuries happen. Knock your opportunity out of the ballpark. And Joshua Dobbs, he's an athletic quarterback. He's got an arm. We've seen it here in the Atlanta area when he beat Georgia with the Hail Mary in the last second at Tennessee. So take your opportunity and run with it. Well, you know what? Speaking of that, if, if, if Deshaun Watson doesn't play for Cleveland, they're finishing last. I'll have Pittsburgh in last now. I'll put them in third. Their quarterback looked really good in, in the first preseason game. I have to get up there since I went up for my father-in-law's surprise 80th birthday party. Kenny Pickett threw a couple touchdown passes through the, the game winner through a two-point conversion. I, I, I know it was a lot of safe passes. They were rolling out and misdirection and all that. But Kenny Pickett looked good. So, but Pittsburgh can't run the ball where the Diddley's poo. So, you know. That's those... not the only pick that looked good. George Pickens looked good as well in a Pittsburgh uniform. He had a nice toe tap, toe tap catch there in the preseason. And that's one of my favorite George Bulldogs of all time. So, uh, I love to see. Thing, one more before thing play. before we go to the Braves. Uh, you know, Troy Anderson didn't make the trip to Detroit. And yet, Atlanta can have had N'Kobe Dean, and he's in Philadelphia. Yeah, that that's a head-scratching play right there. The Falcons hyped Troy Anderson up. Montana State um, played a bunch of positions there. High football IQ guy. We were told this is the guy that they wanted and didn't make the trip. So that's a head-scratching move. Uh, hopefully, it's not injury-related or personal reasons-related. Hopefully it's just something he's not uh, not yet used to the playbook, something that you can get caught up to speed on uh, because that was a second-round draft pick, and the Falcons need all their draft picks firing on as many cylinders as they can get. Well, and Troy Anderson played multiple positions at Montana State. He, didn't he play quarterback at one time? So uh, Quarterback, uh, linebacker, tight end, played like four or five positions. Like I said, high football IQ guy. Right, and the Falcons saw potential in this guy, so I'm not going to, you know, I mentioned they could add N'Kobe Dean and all this and that. It's easy for me to sit here and say that, but they saw something in the film with this football player, and and hopefully it'll work out. Well, let's switch from football to baseball, and I'm going, you already mentioned it, he stole my thing. Vaughn Grissom, the first player since 1900 and first major leaguer to score a run in his first six games. Ever. Folks, you know, it's about scoring runs. That's a hell of a stat right there. But Vaughn Grissom, to me, he's batting, what? He's batting seven tonight, but he's been batting eight and let, and let Harris ninth, the two youngest position players, rookies in Major League Baseball. And I mentioned it last night on another podcast as I was a guest. 
Vaughn Grissom is a good problem for the Braves because what are they going to do if he's still hitting over 300? Ozzy Albies is coming back. Um, let's see. Swanson's not leaving shortstop. Ozzy's is about Ozzy Albies about a 242 50 hitter with power. Let's see. Rosario struggling under 200, even though he's coming along with the eyesight, coming back and all. What do they do with Grissom? Do they just play him every day a second? Put Albies at DH? Do they sit Albies and play Grissom every day? Let's see. Do they move Grissom to left field? And you have and Albies the second base, and you DH your guy. Um, uh, get get it, get it for me. Um, Zuna. Uh, thank you, Azuna. I apologize. Well, there's there's lots of options for Alex Anthopoulos and Brian Snicker. They're going to have to agree on one. But I tell you what, with the way Azuna's hitting and with, or I should say, lack of hitting. Maybe Grissom is your DH when Albies comes back. I I, I know you don't want to you don't want to take him away from the field, but you don't want to put a rookie in a position where he can't flourish if he's not ready to play the outfield. So maybe that's your DH. But there's lots of options. Looks like Arcia may be gone longer than the Braves expected, so that could open up a spot where he can get some spot at bats. But again, you mentioned it, TC. If this guy's hitting right now, he's hitting 429. If he's hitting anywhere close to that, if he's hitting 333 and he cools down to heck it even 280, you got to keep him in the lineup. In six games, he's already hit two home runs. We mentioned the six runs he scored. He's driven in four runs. Uh, the, the guy can play. He just looks like an athlete. And uh, it's a good problem to have for Snicker and Alex Anthopoulos, but they're going to have to get creative to keep this guy's bat in the lineup when Albies gets back because he's a contributor, just like Michael Harris. And it's crazy. Not one, not two, uh, but really three guys in the last couple weeks have come in and contributed. And I'm going down to uh, Trump, uh, Trump or Trump, I can't remember how to pronounce his name. He came in and got two, two, three hits. It's it's unbelievable. The the Braves are ranked in the bottom half of the MLB in in, in prospects, but yet they keep coming in and making contributions. Well, so Trump has had some other at bats elsewhere, but yeah, it's a good point what you made. But uh, Trump, that was funny. You don't have a Make America Great hat again on. I mean, uh, that, that's a good one. No. But, but, but no, you, you get my point. It's just, hey, let's reach on down, and, and they're going right. down, not to triple-A. They're going to double-A and pulling these guys out, uh, and, and, they're, and they're, they're making big contributions. So it's a big, it's a good problem, and it's a big problem once Albies does come back. What you're going to have to get creative. What do they do? I, I don't know. They're gonna, like you said, they'll have to get creative. Grissom can play left. I mean, the, the, you know, Ron Washington's been working with him at second base uh, a lot. Uh, we You can see it on online. If you go uh, to Twitter or whatever, you can see it. You can Google it. Uh, you can do whatever you want. But I, I tell you, my inner Sparky Anderson, he always used to call guys a superstar when he managed Detroit back in the 80s and 90s. He would call them a superstar before they had very little of bats. I'm, my inner Sparky Anderson is coming out. I think Grissom's going to be a super star. That's where I see Grissom. This kid's just got it. The smile, the presence. You know what I like when he hit that home run, JJ? We'll go to football real quick. Or we'll go to the last question real quick. You know what I like? Is that he um, family first guy and then sign autographs for the kids. He just gets it. Let's go on to our last one real quick. Um, can a Braves beat the Mets? They're only, what, four or five and a half uh, out. Uh, Carlos Carrasco of New York got hurt, and he's going to miss some time, uh, four weeks or so, and this hurts the Mets. To me, J.J., it comes down to all about the health of the Mets starting pitching. That's what will decide the division. Yeah, that, that'll decide the division, and it's going to help if the Braves can win this series that they're in with the Mets that started Monday. A four-game set, if they can take three or four of them, they did their job Monday night in a lopsided 13-1 to win. They're on top in the Tuesday evening game as we speak. So if they can take the, the third game or the fourth game in that series, yes, I think they can win. But if they split that series, if they go 2-2 two and, two and it goes back to five and a half games, 
They're going to have to play unbelievable baseball to catch the Mets, and that'll be tough to do. But the answer is yes, they can still do it. They play the Mets, let's see, including tonight. That would be six times total, I believe. They can definitely still pass the Mets. It's going to be a tight race down to the end. It just comes down to the health of Scherzer and DeGrom. I mean, to me, if, if they get quality starts from them and they're healthy, it's going to be tough for Atlanta to catch them. But then again, the way the Braves played last year in August, September, they were on fire. And if they duplicate that, they may be able to catch them. Uh, it, we just don't know. I mean, there's just too many games to go. And then the playoffs is a totally different animal. I just, goodness golly, you saw, uh, um, you saw the Dodgers losing Walker Bueller for the year. That's a big loss for them, even though he's only, you know, six and three with an ERA over four. Hadn't had a lot of starts due to injury, but you, when you got Goslin with 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 career innings already matched, and you got another pitcher, what is it, Alexander? I can't remember his name for the Dodgers. He's up there in innings pitch. This kind of stuff at the end of the year just changes. And now that you have more and more series, you know, but back in the day it was just one series. You're in the World Series. Now you've got extra layers and tiers of playoff to put maximum pressure on a pitching staff. To me, you're going to see teams like Atlanta come out of nowhere and win it more often. Wayne, your Rangers <laughs> fired their manager. Your thoughts on that? Well, I, I'm I'm not even paying too much attention to Texas because they're uh, they're not going to cause any interest in the uh, end of the season or postseason. And I actually watched uh, that whole series of Atlanta when they played down there in or, uh, uh, Miami against the Marlins, and. <clears throat> it you know that series came down to a closing pitchers in my opinion uh you know with scott with uh, uh the marlins practically giving them that fourth game and then with uh jansen uh with that one bulk but uh you know maybe that'd be something that uh you know atlanta could focus on maybe helping their closing pitchers out a little bit because that seems to be what you know come what these games come down to now well it does and you know Jansen for Atlanta, former Dodger. He's the guy now that they traded Will Smith. They picked up a star from Houston. Uh, you know, the, the, this stuff is all a crapshoot, and we'll see what happens. That's the end of the show. We're out of time, guys. Thanks so much for um, thanks so much for coming on. Our normal day is Wednesday. We came on Tuesday. Uh, well, you know, we got Lou on at the last minute today, so – um, it was fun. I really enjoyed it. Once again, you can catch the, uh, catch it over up here on Twitter real quick at ATL Prime Sports. Like and subscribe uh, to the show. It's free. You can catch me at Quarter Todd, JJ, JJ, get you one, Wayne at RWY Junior. JJ, you're going on vacation. Congratulations. You now have a two year old. Good luck trying to catch her on a daily basis. Better get your track shoes, Wayne. Happy birthday to your son, and happy birthday to my father-in-law, who turned 80, and my wife and I surprised him this past weekend in Pennsylvania. Well, that's it, guys. Have a great week. We'll talk to you next week. JJ, you'll be off. It'll be just Wayne and I, and have a great vacation. Get you one.